welcome to the channel. If you happen to be one of my current subscribers, welcome back. It's good to see you again, but chances are you're not. So for everyone else, I'm Jonathan. And in this video, I want to give something of an introduction and quick start to a new-ish framework called Ray that lets you do really easy and effortless distributed computing in Python. Now, if you're familiar with frameworks like Spark or Hadoop, I would say this is in the same family of frameworks of basically systems that do a lot of fault tolerant computing. So you, the developer or the data scientist or the engineer, don't really have to worry about consistency and fault tolerance and whether or not your computation will resume if a machine goes down. And it actually comes out of the same lab that the Spark framework came out of at Berkeley. But Ray itself is a little bit of a different framework in the applications it's designed for. And a lot of people who might see the framework might assume, why do we need a new framework? Why can't we just use something like Spark or Flink or a big database? And this video is going to be a little bit of what the Ray framework is and why do we need it or why would you use the Ray framework, what types of things you can do, and just the general API and abstractions of Ray. So before we dive into the actual framework itself, a little bit of a conceptual introduction to it. This is the Ray site, ray.io. And I just want to show this here to point you in the direction if you do want to learn more. So they do have really good documentation, a bunch of tutorials, example code on, on GitHub, as well as a pretty active forum. So if you are interested in learning or using Ray more after seeing this video, the Ray.io site is definitely a, a good starting place. Before we dive into actually programming with Ray, I think it's a little bit helpful to have a higher level conceptual idea of what Ray is, what it does for you, and what it doesn't do for you. Now from the Ray docs themselves, Ray describes itself as providing a simple universal API for building distributed applications. And the reason I like to introduce it in this way is that it really has this focus on the applications. And if you just come to Ray from something like Spark or a database, you may not think that there's much unique about this. It's really designed for these applications that end up having an end user or someone who's gonna consume some machine learning service. And Ray itself from just the 10,000 foot view provides primitives for running fault tolerant distributed applications. And they really allow you to parallelize something you might write on a laptop or a single machine to work on a cluster with little to zero code changes. And this is kind of the magic of why Ray's special is that it really gets out of your way as a data scientist or developer while still giving you all the benefits of a really robust system with fault tolerance. And additionally, similar to the Spark ecosystem, there's a large ecosystem of applications, libraries, tools, other things built on top of Ray, um, maybe even more so than something like Spark, since Ray does exist at a little bit of a lower level abstraction than a framework like Spark. So if you're not familiar with distributed computing or a cluster or a distributed system at all, kind of the only thing we really need to know about in, in this video is that Typically everyone programs or they start programming on a single machine just because this is easiest to program and debug. And most people don't just have a cluster sitting around. So we're gonna talk about how we can go from this single machine and code on a single machine into a distributed fashion where here I label it as foreman just as an analog to the worker machine. But basically you have some number of worker machines that are worker nodes or other machines in your cluster, and they're gonna do a lot of the computation or processing or data storage. And there is a usually single machine that coordinates everything, in this case, the, the foreman. And to actually expand out this diagram into something that's probably a little bit slightly more realistic. So typically if you're running something on your local machine or a laptop or even a really beefy single server, you have a bunch of CPUs and you have a bunch of hard drives on that single machine. So in this diagram, we have a single, let's say large computer with eight hard drives and eight CPUs. Now to get the equivalent of that computation and storage in a distributed system, we could achieve it in a variety of different ways, but in this case, we're achieving it with four machines. 
So we have four machines, each with two hard drives and two CPUs. So the cluster as a whole has the same amount of storage, eight hard drives, and the same amount of computation, eight CPUs, as a single large server. But the advantage of the distributed system is that it has some flexibility in scaling up and down. So if you wanna scale a single machine, you often have to wholesale upgrade the entire system and it isn't really as flexible as something like a distributed system where you can just add a single machine if you need more computation or add some more machines if you need more storage. But the thing that a distributed system introduces that we don't really have to deal with a local system are these issues of coordination. So when you have a bunch of different machines, I often like to think of it as you have a bunch of different timelines or each machine kind of has its own processing context. So you have to really figure out how you're gonna coordinate and synchronize things across all your machines. So what happens when, who's doing the processing, where's the data live? To do this coordination, you have to figure out some way to communicate between your machines or your nodes. So how do the different nodes or servers in your cluster actually talk to each other? How do they communicate? How do you serialize data between them? And lastly, you have to think of how robust is the system as a whole? Usually if you have a single server, if the single server fails, the whole system fails, you know it fails, and you have to basically redo everything. But with a distributed system, especially if you have hundreds or thousands of machines in your cluster, you really have to build in this idea of fault tolerance. So is your system gonna be robust if there's individual machines that fail or if there's failures in the network or how machines communicate? So these are kind of the new problems of distributed systems. So while you might gain flexibility in how you allocate machines and storage and computation, you also inherit these problems of coordination, communication, and, and fault tolerance. And these are really what frameworks like Ray and Spark solve at the system level. So us as a end user using something like Ray, we don't really have to think too much about the coordination, communication, and fault tolerance since that's what the framework basically provides for us. So to dive a little bit deeper into how does Ray actually do all these things, here's kind of one more detailed view of that distributed systems diagram. So with Ray, you have a head node and you have your worker nodes or your cluster. So in that analogy, our head node is the foreman and our cluster has basically these worker nodes. And Ray is really nice in that it doesn't care if you're running everything on a single machine or if you're running your head node on something like a laptop and your worker nodes are on some cloud service like Google or, or Amazon Web Services. To Ray and to the end programmer, it's all the same. So I don't have to think about where my code is executing on these worker nodes necessarily when I'm writing the program. So the unique thing about the head node that the worker nodes don't necessarily have is a Python driver. And typically there is a bunch of worker processes in the cluster. So the head node has the Python driver, which is a program where you basically are gonna execute commands. Think of this as basically a special Python REPL. And the head node can also have a worker process, but the Python driver, the thing you need to know is that it can't actually execute any code and there's this distinction between the driver program and the worker process even if they're living on the same machine another unique thing about the ray framework is that it has these abstractions called raylets so here in the diagram i have a raylet on the head node a raylet on each worker node in my cluster but the unique thing about ray and what it's really designed to do is that logically all these raylets are treated as a single data structure or abstraction. So think of it almost as a distributed cache, something like memcached, where each machine in your cluster has some amount of storage or memory or computation, but the framework itself provides this unified interface to all of the memory on your cluster and all of the computation on your cluster. So within each Raylet, you have a local scheduler and a local object store. And all the schedulers combined, you think of it almost as a distributed scheduler. So each machine has its own scheduler and its own object store, so it can function without talking to the other machines. But additionally, there is something that coordinates all of the object stores called the global control store, which lives on the head node. 
So if you're not familiar with Ray, this might seem overly complicated. We haven't actually started to program anything. Why am I showing you all this? And the reason I wanted to show this kind of before we dive into code is just so hopefully you can have an idea of what's happening behind the scenes or how's your code actually running? Where is it running? What's running on my laptop? What's running on my cluster? And just have a place for you to put all these ideas. So we'll get more into the details of what and how all these things might talk to each other. But just know from this diagram, there's a head node. What's unique about the head node is it has the Python driver process and the global control store, which is a big metadata store for the whole cluster. It coordinates what data or objects live in which Raylets and how everything could basically be shuttled around your cluster. And then you have some number of worker nodes and each worker node has worker processes that run computation and a shared Raylet, which has the scheduler and the object store, which is basically an in-memory store. And the one line of how I like to think of Ray is if the multi-process module in Python was combined with a remote procedure call framework. So it has the elegance and kind of the nicety of the multi-process module where it has a really usable API but behind the scenes, instead of running it in different processes on your single computer, it actually runs it in distributed processes on a cluster. Before I end the video, I want to give a introduction to the larger Ray ecosystem, what I like to call the Ray layer cake, and to kind of talk about things I'll be introducing in later videos. So what we saw today in this video was Ray core, and this provides both the task API and the actors API, which we'll see in, in a later video, as well as providing the scheduler and object stores for the cluster as a whole. And Ray core is kind of the interface between the cluster or where the machines are running. Um, so there's a Ray auto scaler that handles scaling up more machines and processes on our local machine instead of worker nodes being separate servers, these were just separate processes. But if I were running this in the cloud at scale, you can actually have the auto scaler sit on top of a yarn scheduler or something like a Kubernetes cluster. And this is kind of more of the intended use of Ray is you're not really gonna be running different processes on your laptop, even though you can, you're gonna be running on a large cluster in the cloud somewhere to actually be more efficient with your computation. So Ray Core serves this role as abstracting the cluster and the physical hardware from a lot of the APIs. So with Ray, we have a API or a library that allows us to do really powerful hyperparameter tuning. There's a library to do reinforcement learning. There's a library to do distributed stochastic gradient descent to train machine learning. There is a library to actually serve machine learning models in a really efficient distributed way if you do want to expose this to an application. And there's all sorts of community integrations. So the design of Ray in that it separates the hardware or the cluster from the actual end user API allows a lot of these interfaces to be easily developed and really leverage all of what Ray does from a systems perspective. And kind of in between all of these APIs on top of Raycore, we have a bunch of different language APIs. So we can use Python and program with the tune, RLlib, stochastic gradient descent, RayServe, or we can use Java with any of these APIs, or there's kind of an experimental C++ interface. So depending on which language you want to use or you're comfortable with, and then which type of application you're building? Are you doing hyperparameter tuning? Are you doing reinforcement learning? All of these things kind of fit like Legos in this Ray layer cake. If you found this video interesting and want to learn more about Ray or just scaling data science in general, feel free to subscribe to the channel. I'll be posting videos somewhat regularly about data science, Python, machine learning, distributed computing. If you have a question on anything I covered in this video, feel free to leave a comment below and I'll try to answer those as, as they come up. And if enough people have questions on certain things, I'll possibly make a new video on whatever might have been confusing this video. So thanks if you've made it to the end and hopefully I'll see you again soon.